Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord, everyone. Welcome to this session, this, this Bible study. Uh, we thank the Lord for this opportunity that he's given us. What a, what a privilege we have. Uh, even, even in the midst of what we're going through, we're left with something to work with. And we thank God for this, for this tool, this medium that we're using for this temporary time. Remember, it is only temporary. Uh, we're looking for the Lord to, to do something. We're praying that 2021 20, will be a, a year that, huh, that will possibly transition us back into a sense of a norm, not necessarily norm. We don't want just norm, but we do want to be able to get back uh, to our worship, um, not as it was, but we want to come back different and see God do some things that we did not see him do uh, pre-pandemic. Let us pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you this morning, oh God, for your faithfulness. We're your servants, we're your children, and we need you. We, we can't make it without you, Lord. We need, not only do we just need you, we need to know what you want from us. We need to know your will so that we could please you in all that we do. God, help us today. Speak to us out of the word. Let your spirit talk to us, God. Give us understanding, Lord, of the things that pertain to this hour. We give you glory. We give you praise. We honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So praise the Lord, everybody. What we're going to do, we're going to go in, um, into the word. Um, I want to today I want to talk about the day, the day of the Lord. And and I know that it, that deals with an end time, but but I believe that it also deals with a present time. And so we want we want to approach it from that uh, perspective, but before we come that way, we want to get a little, you know, a little bit of background on what the day of the Lord is. And so we're going to um, bring up our Bible and we, in, a, in a moment, and we're going to, we're going to just kind of go through some, some scriptures that deal with uh, the day of the Lord. First of all, when you look at the, 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 uh, the term, the, the day, the day of the Lord, <laughs> I looked at two usages in the scripture. Maybe there are more, but but this definitely, to me, this is what I have found uh, in my study. And that is uh, the first usage of the day of the Lord is when it depicts the commencement of the consummation of all things. Meaning that uh, it's a day that starts the end. <laughs> you know, it's, it's the day that just, it's like the explosion that goes off and, and and then the fallout after the explosion. So some look at the day of the Lord in that respect uh, as one day, and that's it. While others look at it as a period of time, and and it could it could really mean that because uh, when you define that word day uh, in the Old Testament, one of the definitions figuratively would be a time, and it could be uh, a period of time. Uh, not just from sunset to sunrise or from sunset to sunset, however way you would count it, um, but it would be a time, a time. And so, and that's kind of how I look at it too. I look at it as uh, it's a day that it starts something and then it, it continues on. It continues on until the end of things that when God finished cleaning up everything, I think about uh, what Jesus said, in first Corinthians 15, well, Paul, excuse me, what Paul said in first Corinthians 15 about Jesus is that when he comes, he says that he's, he's going to bring down all authority and, and see, and that won't happen in one day. It's, it's a process. And so when Jesus returns and, and that's really what we aim at his return. And in that return on that day that he returns, everything begins to happen. The second uh, usage of that term day of the Lord uh, is when it's God's judgment upon his people and or the nations in the present age. 
uh, meaning that that term, and I believe that we'll see that in the scripture, that that term day of the Lord is also used, not necessarily looking exactly at the end of things, but at what God is about to do or what, what God is going to do in the sense of judgment, judgment. And so that, that kind of is where we are right now. And, and we want to talk about these things scripturally. Uh, even though the word day of the Lord, I think it's in the scriptures about 25 times. If you were to count them, that the actual term day of the Lord, about 25 times in the scripture, uh, only a few times in the New Testament. Most of it will be found in the Old Testament. Uh, but but it is but it is carried. I think even the little that it talks about in the Old Testament, it carries that term to a whole different level. To, to a completely different level. It really brings things into its end. And so we want to look at it uh, because not only is this time called the day of the Lord, uh, there are other terms also that is called. And, and so we want to look at uh, these scriptures and uh, talk about the other ways that, these, that this particular term is used, even though, uh, like I said, it's a term, but then it's used, there are other terms used, but it's referring to uh, the exact same thing. So uh, first first one I want to look at is in uh, Romans uh, chapter 2, and, and this right here from verses 5 through 11. So definitely we're teaching this morning. Uh, it's called the day of wrath. And so like I said, the, the New Testament carries this idea to a whole different level. And so he, it's called the day of wrath. In verse uh, five, uh, we'll start at verse five. He said, but after their hardness and impenitent heart, treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. And so he's talking about the day of the Lord, but he calls it here the day of wrath. And so, so we know that when we look at it from, uh, the, I call it the primary usage of the term day of the Lord. Uh, we know it's dealing with the end. That's the primary usage of this word. Um, verse two, verse six, he said, who will render, and this will happen on, on, on that day and at that time, who will render to every man according to his deeds. And that would definitely have to deal with those who are alive to them who pay, who, to them who by patient continuance, in well-doing, seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. That will be the conclusion. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath. Goes on. Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the Greek or the Gentile. But glory and honor and peace to every man that worketh good to the Jew first and also to the Gentile, for there is no respect of persons with God. And so he's talking about that in uh, that day of the Lord when it comes. That's when some are going to be granted immediately on that day eternal life. Others are going to be judged on that particular day. The second uh, usage here of that term. Uh, I mean, another way of expressing that term is found in Jude, Jude uh, verse six. And it says, and the angel which kept not the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. He hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. And so that once again, uh, it, it, it seems to uh aim at uh, that day, that time, that time of, of the day of the Lord. But he calls it here the great uh, day. Then in 2 Peter, <clears throat> 2 Peter chapter um, 3, verse 12, he says here, and, and in this case, he talks about, he, he uses it in a different way, looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire, shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. So he calls it, no, notice he calls it the day of God. 
And so, yes, the, the day of the Lord, and, and this is this is really what we're talking about, uh, the day of the Lord. Uh, and the reason that I'm talking about this is because I believe that in, this, in the secondary usage of it, dealing with the present judgment, um, and that's what I'm talking about today, is the, the present uh, judgment of God. Uh, let's just look at, I want to go back again. And, and what I want to look at is, again, I want to look at some more of the primary uh, usage of this term. Okay, so so we want to look at that, the primary usage of this term. All right. Let's see, I'm going to pull this Bible back up, and it looked like it won't come up for us. But that's okay. I'm just going to read <clears throat> anyway. And some of you can just read along in your own Bibles. And so in Zechariah uh, chapter 14, verse 1, and, and now, but like I said, the Old Testament uses this term uh, much more than the New. The New only uses it several times. The Old Testament uses the majority of the times. And so we find, I think we find really uh, how that word is, that term is defined here in Zechariah. And it says in verse 1, behold, the day of the Lord, there's the term, cometh. And thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee, for I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses raffled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. <clears throat> then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. He's still talking about the day of the Lord now. And his feet, this is what will happen in that day, in, in that time. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof towards the east and towards the west. And there shall be a great, a very great valley and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north and half of it toward the south <clears throat> and it shall flee to the valley of the mountains say so you shall flee to the valley of the mountains for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto azal yea ye shall flee like as you fled up, uh, from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of judah and the lord my god shall come and all the saints with him and it shall come to pass in that day <clears throat> that the light shall not be clear nor dark, but it shall be one, excuse me, it shall be one day which shall be known to the Lord, not day nor night, but it shall come to pass that at evening time it shall be light. And it shall be in that day, still talking about the day of the Lord, that is, see the time, it's going to be a, a whole time called the day of the Lord. And in that day, that living waters shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea, half of them toward the hinder sea, in summer and in winter shall it be. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall there be one Lord and his name one. And so th this really just encompasses the whole idea of the day of the Lord and its time. Uh, how God is going to come through his son and he's going to reign and he's going to establish himself here as king and so on. And so we, we look at that primary usage again uh, in Malachi chapter four, uh, verse number uh, one. Let, let's see if I can't um, see if I can't bring <clears throat> bring the Bible back up for you, because uh, I, I would like for you to read along with me. Even though some of you do have your Bibles, I'm sure if I can pull it back up real quickly here. Yes. Okay. So now let's keep let's keep on. Okay. So in Malachi chapter four, verse one, he says, "For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven." And all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be subdued or shall be stubble, excuse me, 
And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. And so he's talking about that a day that's coming. Then he says, but unto you that fear um, my name shall the son of righteousness arise and healing in his wings. And you shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. And you shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, and this is the point. I will send Elijah the prophet before the coming of that great and dreadful day of the Lord. So, so he Malachi lets us know that that day is a dreadful day. And he said, before it comes, he will send Elijah. And Jesus said that when John the Baptist came, he said, he told them that if they could receive this, uh, Elijah has already come. He came because John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah. And so, but anyway, he was dealing with that, the culmination of things there that will come with the day uh, of the Lord. In verse six, he says, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. All right. So now look at, let's look at some New Testament uh, on this day of the Lord. Okay. In first Thessalonians chapter five, verse one. He says, but of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. And when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye brethren are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. And so, so he lets them know that that the day of the Lord will come as a thief. Peter echoes that, and I'll read that in the next verses there. Peter echoed that same thought that Paul did. Uh, and so it's coming, the day of the Lord will come, you might say it's coming without warning, even though there are signs that will show us that that time is near, but yet and still when it comes, no one will know the day or the hour. It will come without warning. Um, when I think about the day of the Lord, the culmination of it, the primary usage of it, it should bring fear to us as God's people. We, we should have a fear that we could, we could be caught off God. And, and so it should motivate us, especially in a time when it's so easy to be ex distracted right now. By so, you know, all that's happening around us is so easy to be distracted. Uh, but we should still keep our mind on this reality. We talk about our hope. If I'm not thinking about the day of the Lord, it, it seems to suggest something about the minimizing of my hope in my heart. Because if I really have that hope strong in me, I can't help but think about the day when this hope is going to be realized, and that will be the day of the Lord. So in Peter, Second Peter. Uh, chapter uh, three. We, we dealt with this last week. We just want to touch it again, and then we're going to move on to our secondary usage. In chapter three, verse nine, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So again, we echo that, that verse of scripture again, that God's uh, uh, his patience, his long suffering is really salvation. And he's, because it's, it's a horrible time when the Lord comes, that will not be a pleasant day for the majority of the people living at that time. And so the Lord in his long suffering, he holds back, but one day there'll be no more holding in verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. He echoes what, what Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5. In the which the heavens shall pass away with great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. 
Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of person ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God. Notice he calls it the day of God. We mentioned that. Wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. And, and you know, these are scriptures that we've read for years and years, but one day we're going to see these scriptures come to pass. They're going to come alive. They're, they're going to be, they're going to act out. God is going to do exactly. These things are going to be seen just as the scripture describes them. But now when I think about the secondary usage, and I just wanted to cover the primary uses so that we won't forget that, uh, because the day of the Lord really primarily is dealing uh, with that final day and time when the Lord will return and do his work and his justice on this earth and establish everything according to his perfect will in heaven. But here in the present time, God is still working. And, and sometimes God works in a massive way. He works in a massive way. And when he works, meaning that he does something at certain times on a level that his daily work, he's, he doesn't he doesn't do this daily, even though he judges, he rewards, he protects, he does all those things on a daily basis. But there's a time of judgment. And this is what what I'm looking at as the day of the Lord and how it was used in a secondary way. And I want to first look at Amos, Amos, Amos chapter five. Now, important point here. That Amos, when he prophesied, and I'm, I'm going to actually look at Amos and Joel because they both use the term, you know, I believe they use it in a secondary uh, way and Joel used it in a dual way, secondary and primary. But, but here, Amos, he prophesied, it, it is said that he prophesied probably between 760 and 750 B.C., you know how in the in the BC how the, the the numbers they decline rather than increase like they do now. Uh, they decline till we get to that one in the first century on and as we come on into 2020. And so so but anyway, he prophesied between uh it is said that he, he prophesied between 760 and 750 BC. Now, this is why am I saying this? Well, because Israel went into captivity. Their captivity began about 733, 740, 733 BC. And the city of Samaria, which was the capital of the Northern Kingdom of Israel, uh, went, it was taken in 724. So when you do your calculations there, what, what, is, what I'm saying is that from the time that Amos prophesied and talked about the day of the Lord, it was about 10, 20 years before everything was completed. 10 years, 20 years. And, and his prophecy came to pass, it, what he said. And, and so, so he was warning the people. Now, <clears throat> what else is important about Amos is when he was prophesying to Israel, they were prosperous. They were a prosperous nation. Uh, agriculturally, they were doing well. Uh, the, the nation was well. They were under Jeroboam. Uh, it was a good, you know, they were, in the natural, it was good, but they were so far from God. So Amos comes from Judah. Here he comes from Judah, and he begins to prophesy here in Samaria. He's, he's prophesying to the northern kingdom. He, he leaves his southern kingdom, Judah, and comes to the northern kingdom, Israel, and prophesies. And he's letting them know that the day of the Lord is at hand. But it, it sounded foolish. It, it didn't make sense. Why is he saying this? It, as a matter of fact, uh, one of the gentlemen that were connected to the king, uh, he, he, he looked at Amos as he was, this, he called it, it's treason. This man is speaking against the kingdom because there's no way that the kingdom can go down. And when I look at America, our wonderful nation that God created for us, it looks like we could never go that far down. It, did, it looked like that for Israel too. 
It looked like Israel, there's no way that this nation could go down. But yet Amos prophesied. And as he prophesied, let's, let's read some of what Amos talked about here. In verse four of chapter five, he says, for thus saith the Lord unto the house of Israel, seek ye me and ye shall live, but seek not Bethel, nor enter into Gilgal and pass not to Beersheba, for Gilgal shall surely go into captivity and Bethel shall come to naught. So, so don't look, he, he, God was calling them to Jerusalem for worship and they didn't want to come. Don't go to these places for worship. Don't, don't seek out these places. In verse 14, he says, seek good and not evil that ye may live. So the Lord, the God of hosts shall be with you as ye have spoken. And so it's one thing to feel that God is with us. When I think about our nation, and of course the church is included, we, we talked about that, that judgment must first begin at the house of God. That, that's what Peter said. The, he said the time has come when judgment must begin at the house of God. So, it, so we know that God will deal with his people. He will deal with his people. So we are involved. We know that. We are involved in what's happening in this nation. And so he tells them, <clears throat> To hate the evil in verse 15 and love the good and establish judgment in the gate. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious unto the remnant of Joseph. So he's calling them to repentance. Wow. How do you get a nation like America to realize that we have backslidden from a place? I'm not saying America has never been saved, but we've been in a place with God a place where we've honored him in God we trust, one nation under God. You know, it's we, we've honored him. We've given him uh, uh, respect as God. We we look at Sunday, look at, look at the blue laws. There was a time where stores, main stores like malls and all that didn't open on Sunday. You know, I'm just, I'm not promoting Sunday, but what I am saying is that it was a sign of how we honored God. You couldn't buy alcohol on Sunday. You know, it was the, the blue laws. It, there, there were laws that governed a reverence to God in our country. I'm not talking about the colonies. Yes, yes, the colonies. But in our country as a nation, we honored God and we see it on our money every day. And so so what would it take to, to convince America that we are in trouble with God? That, that we are, that the church is going on in a lot of ways, like nothing's wrong. Yes, we're shut down some, some are, some are still going to the churches and, and continuing on in the same mode, feeling like we have to press our way, whatever the case. But the point is, is that God wants something. It's something that he's calling for. And when I look at Amos here, <clears throat> Amos, it was going to get really bad, but they couldn't see it. They, they couldn't, capture that things could get so bad that it would seem unreal to us, like this impossible. So again, so he tells them to, to hate the evil and love the good. Verse 16, therefore, he says, the Lord, the God of hosts, the Lord said thus, wailing shall be in all streets and they shall say, in all the highways, alas, alas, and they shall call the husband man to mourning and such as are skillful to lamentation, <coughs> excuse me, of lamentation to wailing. He says that so, so there's going to be so much grief. That's what he's talking about. Th this is what was headed to them and they didn't even realize it. They didn't realize it. He says, and in all vineyards shall be wailing. For I will pass through thee, saith the Lord. Oh, we don't want God to pass through. We say, do not pass me by. No, don't even come this way. Don't even come through here. I don't want you to pass through. Because when you pass through, this was a negative connotation of passing through, passing by. He, he's coming through. That means he's coming to tend to business. Then he says in verse 18, woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. 
Wow. To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. He's saying there are people that want the day of the Lord. Now, this in my mind, as I look at this, this is a secondary use of the day of the Lord because God is getting ready to judge Israel. He's getting ready to, to judge a nation that's prosperous, a nation that is still on top, you might say. But he's getting ready to judge them. And this judgment is called the day of the Lord. Now, they have time. They have, what, 10, 20 years? However you calculate that, maybe 10 years. They, they have right now they can change. They can turn and do differently. They can love the good. They can hate the evil. They, they can repent out of the word that is being given to them. We need the prophetic word. We've been talking about that. We need it. We really need God to raise up the church, not to fight so President Trump can still be president. I mean, you see this on the TV, on the news and, and the different news uh, you know, channels that are, are far right and whatever. It's it's ridiculous. Let the nation go on, church. Let them do what they do. It's like the church needs to concentrate on what God has called us to do. And we'll get into that a little bit as we go on. So, so he says, you desiring the day of the Lord. Now you're hearing uh, different preachers or prophets, so-called. Some of them are so-called. Some of them may be genuine. But but you you hearing them now? Judgment is coming. Judgment is coming because President Trump is not the president. That doesn't make sense to me. That's not why judgment is coming. There are things that are happening in our nation that has been happening for many years, many years, and it's coming to a head. And so God is dealing with us. I don't want to uh, pronounce judgment over a nation that I live in, in any nation, but especially the nation I'm living in. Why would I want to pronounce judgment when I got to live here? It's like I'm going to be exempt. And I'm saying, oh, the day of the Lord is coming. God is coming. That's what Amos is saying here. Woe to you that desire the day of the Lord. You're saying judgment, judgment. You're not doing what it takes for judgment not to come. But you're thinking that you're in place. This is the idea. I'm in place. God is with us. God is with me. The church need to know that when God moves, when the day of the Lord comes, in this secondary term, using it, terminology, when the day of the Lord comes, if we are not in a position for that to happen, we don't want that to happen. Look at what he says. I'm going to read that verse one more time. Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? What, what is it when the day of the Lord takes place or when the judgment of God comes on a nation? What, what is it to you? What, what is it going to do for you? What do you, will you get out of that? Nothing, because I'll be in the midst of the judgment. He says the day of the Lord is darkness. It's a dark day. It's not light. It's not light. Let's let's go to Joel. So remember this now, that they went into captivity. The enemy came uh, to their streets, took them away from their cities, brought them, scattered them throughout the world. The day of the Lord, the devastation, the death. You can only imagine how much death he told us in the streets. There would be more. I'm going to go back. In verse 16, he said, therefore, thus saith the Lord, the God of hosts, the Lord said, thus, wailing shall be in all streets, and, there shall say, and they shall say in all the highways, alas, alas, and they shall call the husband man to mourning and such as are skillful of lamentation to wailing. Wow. Everybody got to cry. Because that's how bad the day of the Lord is. When God, I'm not talking about a gradual judgment. I'm talking about when God has made a determination that I'm going to judge this nation. There are many nations that have been judged. There are many nations that used to be nations that are not nations anymore. Go back in history. You'll see empires that stood strong are no longer empires today. America is somewhat of an empire. 
And we don't want our nation to go down, even though if we go down to a point where we're not considered that we don't have as much influence in the world as we uh, have right now and as we once had, but we still are strong. See, that's that's just the way things go. But we don't want to end up being so low on the totem pole until nations are walking on us and treating us like we are less than human. And that's what happens when God allows that time of judgment, the day of the Lord. Let's look at Joel now. In my mind, Joel also touches this. We're going to start in chapter one here. He says, the word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Petriel, hear this, you O men, and give ear all ye inhabitants of the land. Have this been in your days or even in the days of your fathers? Tell your children of it and let your children tell their children and their children another generation. And, and now look at this. Something is happening. And I'm going to read verse four. That which the palmer worm have left hath the locust eaten. And that which the locust have left hath the canker worm eaten. And that which the canker worm have left have the caterpillar eaten. And so, so there's devastation on their crops, the food supply, their sustenance, their ability to live has been under attack on a, in a, such a massive way that Joel is describing it here until he says, give ear all you inhabitants of the of the land, have this been in your days or even in the days of your fathers? When I thought about that, I thought about right now what we're going through. Listen, it's been just over a hundred years ago that there was a pandemic on this level. And, and it was seemingly greater at that time. We don't know where this will end. Thank God that, that it seemed that we may have some solution to help uh, bring this thing down with the vaccines. Only God knows that. Only God knows if that's what, what he's allowing. Uh, we, we don't know how long anything will last. We don't know. But but during that time, over over just over 100 years ago, there was a pandemic, the Spanish flu. And so, so we know it, it is calculated that about 600,000 Americans died and millions of people died in the world. And so my mom wasn't alive then. Maybe there, there, there are a few people that were alive then that's, that's alive now, but they probably were children and really didn't know the impact of what was happening. But, but overall, he's saying there's something happening in your day that no one has ever experienced. We never experienced this. Generations have, but we haven't. And I look at what we're going through. We never experienced this. We never experienced shutdowns and on this level like this and, and people dying every day. They, they're saying people dying from this particular disease. We know that there are diseases that's killing people every day, but this is not just the normal disease. This is like a, this right here is a virus that's traveling that we have not known about this particular one. And so here it is, it's happening to us. In this day, and I look at what's happening, it's like a chaos that's breaking out in our land. It's happening in the world. It's been happening in the world. But I'm just looking at where we are right now. It says, have this been in your days? No, not in our days, not in my days. I, I never dreamed of this. I, this never came to my mind to be going through something like this where you got to stand in line uh, to get a, a case of water or you can't find toilet paper or, or whatever. You know, it's like, what's wrong? What's going on? People are dying. People we know have died during this time. And not only from that, but from other things that it's, it's like a spirit of death has been unleashed and it's happening. You know, di different celebrities are dying. I mean, they always die, but it's something about it. It's people that you know, you know, you hear more about, and now people are dying. And it's like, wow, so many. When I go down the list of the people that I know or know of who have died this year, it's not like any other year that I've lived in. And, and so I'm looking at this, and Joel is saying, think about it. 
that means that God is doing something. You got to bring God into the equation of this. That, that's what he was really trying to get them to see. Look at what has happened to you. This has never happened to you in your time before. You have no record of this for your life. But tell it to your children so they can tell it to theirs because this is notable. This is historical what is happening and it's all negative. Then he says, awake you drunkards and weep and howl all of you drinkers of wine because of the new wine for it is cut off from your mouth. And so he's talking about those that, that indulge in their wine and so on. He's like, no, you don't have it anymore. The, the canker worm, the palmer worm, that caterpillar, the locust, they have taken the crops, they've, they've destroyed your vineyards. You don't have this anymore. And this is where they were. And he was showing them that you have a reason to be, to feel like you're in trouble, that things are not going well for you. On verse, verse six, for a nation has come up upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. And, and so these are these locusts, all these different kinds of locusts that have been sent on the land. That means God sent it. God sent it. God says, go. And they went. I believe that God is God said that for us, go. And things are happening to us. Listen, what is what's happening is to bring us to attention. It, it's, it's to bring, and we know this, this is old news. But it's to bring us to attention. I, I just kind of think that God isn't getting our attention. We're kind of doing some things, going through some motions. But I believe what he's really calling us for, we're not giving that to God. He's not getting that. So he says that this what is come, God sent this. It's God, God is behind it. If you're going to blame somebody, we can blame in a natural way. We might want to try to say China or whatever. No, you need to look up. That's what we need to look and say, God, you sent this. You allowed this. If you allowed it, you sent it because you didn't stop it. You wanted it to come. And there's a reason you wanted it. The deaths have taken place, God. Lord, you sent death to us. Lord, what, what are we going to do? He's going to talk to us and tell us. He says in verse 12, the vine is dried up, the fig tree languishes, the pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, and the apple tree, even all the trees of the field are withered because joy is withered away from the sons of men. What God was doing, he was taking their joy. And here it is. We have so many toys in this age, technological age, this age of science. Of, of that that robots are coming for we have so much that we can kind of distract ourselves from our troubles we have netflix we, we we have hulu we we have hbo we we have everything we can sit back and relax we can just like just let it just pass away god while i put my lift my feet up on my recliner but god is he's saying just like for them i'm messing with your joy don't replace it with something else and that's what happens. I think people, they try to use a substitute when, without, when really we should just say, God, I'm confused. Lord, I'm broken. I'm in, I'm in sorrow. What are we supposed to do? That's what he's trying to get us to do. He's trying to get the church. Yes, the church. He's trying to get the nation to come to its knees, fall on its face and realize there is a God that has helped you in the past and he wants to help you now. So he has sent this. He's allowed this to come. Verse 13, he says, gird yourselves and lament ye priests, how you ministers of the altar. Now remember, he's speaking to a religious nation. America, we, we're really losing our religion. You know, and, and you know, religion is not a word that you kind of that, like want to put a lot of focus on, but there's some reality in it. It's a devotion, a devotion to God. But we are losing it. I think in the I, I was looking at a Pew research, Pew research, and I think in the last 12 years, 
We've gone from 77% people professing Christianity in America to, I think, right now at 65%. Look at that decline in 12 years. In 12 years, from 77% to 65%. That, that's that's a, a major drop. A major drop. And I'm saying 12 years, no, it's a 12% drop. 10 in the last 10 years, in, in the last in the last decade, we have declined, declined, and we're still declining. As I speak, we're declining. People are leaving. More people are becoming atheist, agnostic, and non-religious. More people, it's an constant increase. Well, they, they just don't want anything to do with it. So so we are pushing, we're literally pushing God out of our society. And if we push God out of our society, we fall into what the psalmist said, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. We are forgetting God. And, th and that's just where we are. And so in the love of God, the, the compassion and the mercy, God should send trouble to mess with our joy. He wants our joy to be disturbed. Don't act like we got all this joy when we, God is saying, no, I'm taking your joy. I'm taking it for a reason. Look at it. He tells them, gird yourself, lament you priests, how you ministers of the altar. Who's gonna do this? Well, the world isn't gonna do it. The rest of America isn't gonna do it. It's left to us. It's left to the church to get on it. Get on it, that, that we have to do something. Not just a lot of talk, not just political. God hasn't called us to be political. He's called us to be spiritual. Political and spiritual are two different things. Yes, we live in this world. We deal with the politics of this world, but God has called us to spirituality, to look in a world that is invisible. That's what he's called us to, because that's where the reality comes from. That's where the help of God comes from, the invisible realm. There's another realm that will affect this realm and will cause God's will to be done in this realm as it is in heaven. So he taught, tell the ministers of God, for the meat offering and the drink offering is withholding from the house of your God. That means you can't worship him the way he requires. Ah, listen to that, that God should take the ability from me away from me of what he's required me to do. Now, he's required me to do something, but he takes my ability that I can't do it. And that's what he's telling them, that I've taken from you your means to give me what I require. Wow, that's serious to me. For the meat offering and the drink offering is withholding from the house of your God. He says, sanctify ye a fast. Ah, call a solemn assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry unto the Lord. Cry. He, he's calling, he's still calling for a cry. We're getting there. We almost finished too. Alas, for the day of the Lord. Look at that. For the day, alas, for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand. Wait a minute. Now, I thought they were, they'd already lost so much and that God had affected their joy, that God has sent his army uh, to attack their, their livelihood. And all this is happening to them. What do you mean the day of the Lord is at hand? That means that the real hand of God hasn't been seen yet. See, that's the revelation of this in my mind. I, I believe the Lord sent me to Joel. I avoided it for a moment, but then I went to Joel and I just read it. I didn't know I would minister from it, but I was impressed that I got to go and you got to go read Joel. And so I have. And in reading it, I'm beginning to see it and hoping. You can only hope that God, you're not talking to us like this, are you? that there's a day of the Lord coming to a nation. And I'm not talking about the primary usage of that word. I'm talking about that when the day of the Lord, when the judgment of God is on his people, 
and nations or and or nations, the world, when, when he brings a judgment and then backs away. Wow. And you call that the day of the Lord, the day when the Lord, and again, not just one single day, a time that God will work in. But, but what he's saying to them is that it's at hand. It's not here yet. At hand means it's near. He was telling them that the day of the Lord is near. And he's, he's sent these things to prepare you so that you will seek after him to avoid this day. Oh God, as Amos talked about, what is that day to you? Why do you want it to happen? Why do you want judgment? Because you don't know what it's like. We don't know what the day of the Lord is like. It's just like they had never experienced this thing with the locusts and all. Neither have they experienced what was coming that would be greater than what was happening with the locusts and these, these things that were happening, the fires that were breaking out. Look at this. So he says, again, alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand. And as a destruction from the almighty shall it come. Oh God, Lord, don't let it be so. Don't let it be so. Verse, verse 19, I'm, excuse me. Uh, yeah, verse 19. He says, O Lord, to thee will I cry. For the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness and the flame hath burned all the trees of the field. The beasts of the field cry also unto thee for the rivers of waters are dried up and the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness. You remember all the fires that we've had. We, we're forgetting all these things. You know, I think that America just, oh, it's global warming. That's just, just we just got to fix that problem. Listen, we can't fix that. And when God has allowed this thing to come, listen, I need to go to one more, one more passage here. One more set, set and then I'm going to, oh God, and then I'm going to go ahead on and, and, and end this. Let's, we're going to look at Joel. Open it up for you there. Chapter two. I got I got to look at chapter two a little bit here. In verse one, he says, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion. Phew, church. There's no sense in doing that for the world. Blow the trumpet and sound an alarm in my holy hill. And and see, this was he told them to do this in a time of war. You, you sound that alarm. If you sound the alarm, I think that's in chapter 10 of Numbers. He said, when if you sound that alarm, what will happen? The Lord will come and help you. Whoa. He will come and help you. But you got to sound that alarm so he can come and help. It, it's, it's, a, it's an alarm of it's a it's an alarm of a cry for help. It's an alarm that says, I know that our deliverance is in you. It's not in the vaccine. We, the vaccine can become 100% effective and it won't stop the day of the Lord. See, because what has come is only to affect our joy. That's why death is involved. You don't laugh during a time of death. You, you mourn. He wants mourning. He wants a brokenness so that that day doesn't have to come. So that day, just it just won't have to come. He, he wants that. That's what God wants. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord cometh. For it is nigh at hand. He's saying the day of the Lord is close. It's at hand. It's near the day of the Lord. And I, I just believe that we haven't seen anything yet, even though what we've seen is a lot. I don't believe we've seen anything yet if there isn't an adjustment made. Something has to happen. If God opened the door, allow us to the churches to flood to flood back in to flood back into the churches again. 
if he allows that to happen, then guess what has to happen? We've got to come in with a mind seeking God. I mean, for because we know that something is coming, that God has to judge what's happening in this nation. He has to judge that. He can't leave. He can't be silent. He says the day, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and a thick darkness. As the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong there have not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. And some believe he's still talking about the destruction of their crops and things. And while others believe he's dealing, he's talking here about the enemy invading them. And, and I'm telling you that the enemy, the enemy will come in. He will, he will come in and he will invade. And it can happen. Jew, Israel didn't think that that could happen to them. They didn't think it could, but it happened. It took them, took them away, took them from their country, took them out. The day of the Lord came. They did not avoid it. And I believe that he's calling us. It's going to be a day of darkness. He, he, for them, he said, that's what it would be. It would be a day of darkness and gloominess. He says, you, 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 you will not have a record of this that you can go back and, and read and say, oh, that's the same thing that happened to them. He says, no, even to years of many generations. Then he says, a fire devoureth before them and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them. And he goes through all of these things. I'm going to move on down. Then he says this. He says this in verse number 13, verse 12. Therefore also now said the Lord, turn ye even to me. Let me go back to verse 11. He says, and the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his cap is very great. For he is strong that executed his word. For the, Lord, for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? Wow, that's so serious to me when he's talking in a secondary term using the word day of the Lord. And yet he moves on to the ultimate day of the Lord as you as it, there's a reference there. There is a reference there. He's dealing with the ultimate day of the Lord. And yet he's dealing with a time that would come on them even in their present time. Wow. He says, therefore, also now, saith the Lord, turn you even to me with all your heart and with fasting and with weeping and rend your heart and not your garments and turn unto the Lord your God for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and repenteth him of the evil. It says, who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly. If God allows us to assemble again, he's not allowing us to assemble for the normal routine. He's assembling us to find him. That's what he's doing, to find him. I pray that no later than April, that things are such that God will bless us, that our churches can begin to come back together again. And I pray that we come with a revelation of God, knowing that God, the day of the Lord is at hand. That means it is near. Let the priests, he said, he said, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breast. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep before the porch and the altar and let them say, spare thy people. Ah, God, spare your people, O Lord. Give not thine heritage to reproach that the heathen should rule over them. God, we don't want others on our land, my God. And that's what that trumpet was about. 
when they would sound the alarm, when the enemy has come on their land to create war with them, that God would come and help them because they're sounding the alarm. This is what time it is. We must sound the alarm before that great dreadful day should come upon us. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep before the altar. Weep, he says, and say, spare thy people, O Lord, Give not thine heritage to reproach that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say? Why should they say among the people, where is their God? He says, then will the Lord be jealous for his land. God, we want God. We want to provoke him to jealousy through our crying to him, through our seeking him, through our fasting and assembling and going for it. But in this time right here, do what we must. Let know that the joy has been affected. The Lord goes on to say, yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil and you shall be satisfied therewith and I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen. And I believe that God will begin to recover us through a mighty awakening of his spirit and begin to affect our government and affect those around us that we'll see major harvests of souls coming to the Lord because this is why Jesus died, to save the lost. And when the church is unfit, unfit to save the lost souls, that we are so caught up in the commercial, commercialized Christianity, selling everything that we can sell, performing on the stage, seeking for money, looking for all of these things, you've got to know that the church is not fit for the commission. God must make us fit. The day of the Lord is at hand. Father, we thank you. We honor you because you are God. We ask, Lord, that you would allow your presence to be with us. God, do what you have to do, Lord. Oh, God, with us, cause us to come to that place, oh, God, to come to that place, Lord, where we are, are, are doing what is required, Lord. Oh, God, help us, Lord. Help us that we won't fail you in this hour. Help us, oh God, that we will give you what is required in this time, that we won't waste time, but we will use time to the benefit of your purpose. God, bring us back together and put a cry in us, a consecration in us, a seeking in us that we may find you and we will turn away a hand of wrath that will come because you are righteous to judge sin and bring justice to the earth. Bless your people. We trust you, God, that you've given us hope in the midst of these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you, everybody, and may, may God's face smile upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' name.